God for selling me clothes, Jotham for selling me plain. If ever I live for a soldier again, devil shall be me sergeant, poor old soldier. Right, ladies and gents, we're in the uh, armour. 1500 to 1650. I have no idea how anyone on foot or on horseback would be able to wear all this stuff. It's a cracking display, and this has been on my doorstep and not known about it. Some of the early flintlock muskets, and I'm just guessing, uh, circa 1660, no, like Oliver Cromwell and stuff like that. And war warfare in the early days was brutal. Look at these things. Look at these things. They're, they're just horrible, aren't they? Man has used his ingenuity to uh, dispatch him in much more efficient ways since these, these days. I mean, seriously, ladies and gents, you know me, I'm a realist, but you see this and this? I'm on a battlefield and somebody's running at me, hairy arse, and he's got one of these in his hands. I'm just going to run away. I'm serious. I'm going to kick somebody in the leg who's near me so he falls down, and then he gets it and I'll get away. It's all the Under Armour stuff. The metal work for, for, for the time period is unbelievable, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yes. I always used to watch old medieval films. I always loved these, the old knights are jousting. It's <laughs> just wrong, isn't it? <laughs> Battering somebody. Oh. There's no uh, grandpa's books in here. I mean, look at these things. I mean, these are just wrong, you know, they don't say that's proper, brutal, brutal. If you come at me with one of them, I'm a brave bloke, but I'm, I'm, I'm not stupid, I'm just going to run away. Fifteen hundred to seventeen hundred pole arms. Yeah. These, these things, guys, they're just brutal, aren't they? Oh, okay. They come from. the helmets. And look at these things. This is like fifteen twelve. So look at the intricate work on these things. I mean, they look like stainless steel, I'm sure they're not, but because they didn't have it in them days. But look at all this intricate work. And that's 1620, the one we're looking at now. Yeah, oh, look. Here is one that um, probably Will Moran had. <laughs> Even that perverts in them days. It's a bit wrong, isn't it? <laughs> if you come at me wearing one of these helmets, I'm going to leg it. We then come into another World War II type of scenario. Mason, that's my camera. Mason, I think this is the gentleman who went hunting Nazis and they slaughtered some guys in the SES. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I think he was uh, the guy that Ian Fleming, based on James Bond, or became you know part of uh, James Bond. I'll, uh, I'll come back to that. But emergency jump night. 
don't know. It's a secret agent stuff. Huh? It's all a bit espionage, this bit here, ladies and gents. Espionage. Some of the early stuff. Early James Bond stuff. That's East, uh, East German Stasi, uh, their secret police. It's literally painted on camouflage and snow camouflage. There you see. This is the Peter Mason, or Captain Peter Mason's collection. You see the very early style of Dents and Smock. Very early style. Um, first, first pattern because it only goes down to there. It's a pull over head type not the pulls there. KGB uniform. So he went from being uh, in the special air service to literally becoming uh, a spy working behind the lines. East Germany, the very, very early years when they were still um, building the wall. Third round sites. Daggers, they are very small. Okay. Ian Fleming, sort of espionage here. Poisonous weapons. Pipe cigarettes. CI cigarette holder. Uh, poison blowgun. 1964. Poisonous pipe blowgun is 1962. Mechanical pencils that you know John Wicks would have liked. They've got stabby things inside. Now, uh, this is the umbrella that George Markov and the uh, come from Bulgaria, and uh, the Russians killed him with the is it the little pellet that was in it? Right, but. This umbrella contains a needle in its tip that when stabbed into the victim ejects a 1.7 mm pellet containing richlin into the body. The victim will, will quick, quickly die apparently natural causes. Uh, and there is the actual tiny pellet there, so it's in the end. And uh, that's the picture of the guy they killed. Now Russians don't muck about. Suicide cartridge, some of them I don't need and uh, the KGB cyanide cane. Oh, terrible people. And even things, um, bicycle pump gun. <laughs> it's a, probably a one shot weapon inside of that. And then we can see the barrel on the cocking system. Here we 
have some guns, guns, guns. This is some of the original James Bond stuff as well. Dummy, Walker, PPK. Amazing James Bond PPK. So that is a, a real one. This one is a cigarette gun. Fountain pen is actually a uh, 4.5mm single shot reloadable weapon. The barrel screw unscrews for loading and reloading, it's specially designed cartridges. So, that, ladies and gents, is a shooter. But it's not a shooter that you take to a shooter, it is a, a one off jobby. Captain Peter Mason's uh, Rolex watch. This vintage Rolex watch was issued to Mason by the government. Very few of these were actually issued to operatives. That in itself is a priceless. Uh, and if you shave with that razor, you die. Uh, See why sh shell piece razor circa 1965. A pipe pistol. Again, 4.5 millimeter single shot reloadable weapon. All very early secret squirrel James Bond stuff. And here we see uh, some more. Early concealment holster, holsters, battle kit. Um, that's a KGB sort of first attempt at body armour. These are some weapons from Peter Mason's collection Luger P38, PPK, brand in 9mm. And while I thought that initially looked like there was some on this, uh, Check model 27. A little uh, liberator gun there. And a stick gun. <laughs> Ooh, M3 Geese gun. I actually fired one of these. Had one in, in HQ Armory. Smaller SMG. Uh, if you find this at night, it's got a hell of a flash from the, the muzzle. SMG used to be my personal weapon as a, a number one on the Milan post. Uzi. Who doesn't love an Uzi? <laughs> and the granddaddy of them all. Um, Thompson submachine gun. And the uh, M3 get grease gun which was their American version of our uh, Sten gun. Um, but was a very very effective weapon. It had a 4.5 um, not 9mm, so it had quite a knockdown on it. And one of my most favourite weapons, and I have shot one on many, many occasions because we um, had one in our HQ armory. And it was just to be concurrent activities, we'd get out a couple of AKs and you know, um, SVD. Uh, we had one of these that was rebelled for 7.62 NATO, so we could take it on the range and fire all day, every day. Uh, but a Russian uh, Dragonov SVD rifle. In a 7.62 long, which is the same, um, roughly the same as our 7.62, and not the 39, which is the smaller AK round. And they say sniper rifle. Mm -hmm. That's got the original uh, Russian scope on it. Really good out to 600 meters, but I would say it's more of a sharpshooter's rifle than. Uh, a sniper rifle, but for its time it was the dog's dandy when it first came out. It's old Remington pump a a action and uh, Captain Peter Mason's counter sniper. Um, right, 
Mason acted as a counter-terrorist sniper at the G8 summit at Banff, Canada in 2002. Sorry, yeah. yeah 2002. Uh, his weapon was specially made as an anti-sniper rifle. I'm reading that because I don't think you can there. There is a very, very unique rifle. Mm. I'd like to take that on the range. Go around. I love doing it. I've got 30 yard six and they got a hell of a kick. Proper, proper rifle. Now this is a rifle. It's a proper rifle. It's a proper shooter. And it is one that you would take to a shootout. The lighting's not actually brilliant in here, but it's a rapier system. That's a missile itself. I would see camp missiles, I mean, very early. TSR2. That was an aircraft that never was. The Labour government completely kiboshed it. It would have been a world beating aircraft. Um, way above its time, British Aircraft Corporation, TRS2. And they cancelled it. Um, they just thought all, all future warfare would be via missiles. And that's the engine from one of them. If you don't know what a TSR2 is, then please have a little look, because it was a, very much a missed opportunity. And uh, it would have made the F-111 look like a girly. jumpsuits that uh, literally this you see this camouflage it was actually physically dobbed on with paint over the old coveralls okay. I'll be as close as I can. Well rod the first time I've ever seen one certainly up close. The silence pistol. Mm -hmm. Still used by special forces many, 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 many years after its inception. The old uh, gravity knife that paratroopers used to use there. Oh, they spend all day in there. It's got some beautiful stuff. It's got loads of well, it's a museum so it's got lots of history. And again, it's got Peter, um, Peter Churchill and Odette Swanson. If you don't know who she is, please go away and find out. There's a distinguished service order. Peter Churchill and Odette uh, Sanson. The first time I've seen one of them with a silence on. <laughs> All you guys that think your Leatherman's a, a new invention, get real. <laughs> oh, cow tops. Nasty little things, but very good for stopping vehicles with wheels. And there's loads of stuff about. Um, all the radio gear and all that type of stuff. Very nice. I mean, if they hit the 
shells and big bangs. Loads of stuff, right? Here we see some various versions of the Thurbrand Sykes. Come on, don't they? So I'm getting a reflection there. But then look at this thing. British smash it. Right, this is an early first paratrooper smash it. These weapons were introduced to give the user a fight psychological advantage over the enemy in hand to hand fighting. Let's just have a look at that buffer. Oh, oh yes, advantage. Ding! And the old noise. For the Royal Marine class knife. Again, you can still get them today. Ooh, that's a bit of a hole in it. Oh. If you want to kill somebody, because you don't want to die, you always got to have a better weapon than he is. That will be quicker, or see him first. Right, and here we uh, have some canoes. Yeah, and one of the early versions of the Kerbit smoke. Again, and that's painted on. It started off with a very, very deep olive drab. And that is original. Some of the Klepper canoes. extra gear on or something you'd attach to a ship and then paddle away fast speed and blow it up. Do you think they would paddle for miles and miles and miles just to go into a harbour, either recon or place demolition charges on? Absolutely amazing guys. Couple Mark II. Cockle Mark II and uh, a Mark II aluminium sectional sailing canoe. I mean, just look at this stuff. I mean, it's the stuff of horror films, but that was the protection in the day, ladies and gents. Some of the early ones, the bar mine, the intelligent bar mine, uh, LA7, Taylor mine, Russians were nasty gits, the old little LCs, they were horrible. See, they've got a little bit to comply with, um, you know, uh, Geneva Convention, they've got a little metal strip underneath these. That you can see there, and it's dead easy to pop off. It literally clips on and off. That's so they can be detected. Uh, it's illegal uh, or unlawful to put a mine in that can't be detected. But everybody did it. Oh, ladies and gents, them in the know will know. Trip player. And I tell you what, I can take you back to uh, 1981. It was in January. In the order of late February, I was taught how to set one of these up. And even now, all of that time, that, that the actual trip player. It's got a working distance of 18 metres. I do remember little facts like that, because I was taught by professionals, that's why. Oh, the bounding mine, that went Yeah, um, horrible things. Russians spread them all over Afghanistan. Little butterfly mines. Used to come out of a large container and it would just be an aerial denial anti personnel system. Horrible, horrible weapons. They kill more civilians than they do um, soldiers. Oh, yeah. There was a little butterfly bomb that the Luftwaffe used to. To drop. Some of them would go off instantly and they'd have various um, timers on them. German SD2 butterfly bomb, the circa 1942. I always used to love watching a uh, Danger UXB when I was a kid. And there was a cut of series where they give the uh, ordnance people, um, bomb disposal people, a lot of problems. I'm 
day because there's not a great deal of light here, ladies and gents. One of the bulbs has gone. Oh, this is proper. I've got a bit of a bit of a jobby on here. It's anti-tank stuff. <laughs> Boy, is 5.5 anti-tank rifle. Um, actually fired one of them one time. I still remember the kick. Ooh. But very much used by the rifle brigade in the desert. I mean, they were the first one to start using it as an anti-material rifle, much in the same way they use a Barrett 50 calibre rifle now. But like I say, that was back in 41, 42. Here we see the old uh, 3.5 bazookas. And there we see the bazooka. Bazooka ran, been stabilised. And let me know, no, no, the 66. Disposable. Uh, I say anti-armour weapon because it wouldn't really stop a tank it would stop a BMP no dramas if you hit it right oh, here cool and the Charlie G or more commonly known as the 84 we used double birds for it uh, lovely weapon just it weighed a lot and the ever got given the 84 um, each eight-man section would have one of these. It's the, the 1980s to 1990s bazooka. But it was a recordless rifle. When this thing went off, the overpressure and underpressure from the rounds here, oh, it, you know what I mean? You, you, grew, you grew a new pair of nuts. And, uh, yeah, oh, five, umpteen number of rounds. Um, and here we have what's well, called the Law 80, or the 94 as we called it, and that was the replacement for that one-shot disposable um, anti-tank weapon. It had a very good chance of taking out the Soviet tanks at the time, which was a T-72 and a T-64. If they had explosive reactive armour, well, the latest versions of this comes with tandem warhead. But inside of there is a 9mm pistol, uh, and it's a spotting man. So you'd fire the 9mm round, as soon as you saw that impacting the target, I think there was like eight or nine rounds in there, um, then you just quickly click over and fire your main gun round. Very, very accurate. Here's a little weighty rocket. Must, must admit, that's the first time I've seen one. That is, that's what comes out of there. And obviously, that's it. Deployed. But it was a one-shot weapon. Um, which was good, nothing wrong with it bit of kit but when you had a Charlie G one bloke would carry that and then number two would carry at least two to four rounds then you could give each member of the section a round to carry in the Bergen so when you were dug in you had eight or nine rounds with this one and with that you'd need to carry eight or nine of them I always remember we used to nick the straps off these they had lovely straps on them see the strap along the top I made a yoke out of two of them straps, <laughs> but don't tell the, don't tell the RQ, because they were supposed to go back intact, but they didn't. Oh, here we see the strapping. I made a yoke out of that. But that was a lovely weapon and very advanced for its time. Any tank weapons, you see? I like tanks. Mm, I like killing them. I am and always will be, in my infantry blood, an anti-tanker. Yeah, you can have all your mortars and all your snipers and all your recce when it comes to the battlefield. The people who can kill the tanks and the armoured fighting vehicles, they will be in uh, great demand. Yeah. And uh, some of the Napoleonic uniforms here. Very nice. Very pretty. Very pretty, red and, yes, red coats. Hornblower. Yeah, 1804, that's one. And now we look to what the soldiers would wear. This is a King's Royal Rifle Corps of 1832, which is one of the regiments that were aligned with the, well they came about because they were the 95th rifles. It's nice to see that uniform. And here we see some uh, British uniforms. 
But I'm getting the reflection on that, off the glass, ladies and gents. I can't do nothing about that. That's like Q8. The old uh, issue vests and so forth. Slightly earlier with the horrible armour that wouldn't really work. 58 pattern webbing. Never seen that before. It's probably part of an ECM kit. Soldier of the 90s in desert uniform. Um, a lot of you may still use the um, PLC 90 Bergen. Here we see uh, the early versions, which were the better versions of the uh, PC 90 and PLC 90 webbing. Well, they will change that over to DBM and a Law 80. This looks to be a Royal Marine because he's looking quite fancy and he's got the Archist 30 version uh, 42 chest rig on there. Oh, this is an SS guy. I won't have a clothing. So even on that, still got the jungle shirts, they were so popular. <laughs> And uh, yeah, the first, the early issue. Ooh, these are the ones with the Soldier 95 pockets on them. And uh, gaiters. They were, they're a much underrated piece of kit when you're out there walking for miles. And again, this is looking very SAS jungly. Alice Pack, jungle boots, jungle shirts. Now jungle trousers just they seem more of a earlier pattern colour of the DPM. The later jungle shirts had just were more vibrant colours. But yeah, you've got the low mounted web in. Yeah. See this where they just used to cut the rims off the hat so you could actually shoot your rifle with it. But this is a proper one, a proper one. Because they haven't sewed it all up, they just, I mean, it's, you can see all the, the threads hanging from it, it's manly, it's, it's proper. Then we see a uh, power trooper. And we don't talk about power troopers anyway, do we? So we're swiftly move on. <laughs> Northern Ireland. And uh, everything else I wore, we had high legs. Never actually used one of them except when I was on the gate because we had a need for improved Northern Ireland body armour which went underneath. But I wish I had a sh shilling for every time I've been behind one of them shields when I've been bricked and bottled. Oh, I saw an M Every time I see an MBC suit, I always think of Pete Mine Wiseman. <laughs> but people who, who, who um, moan about wearing a mask or whatever, whether you like it or not, please, I'm not bringing it into it but um, when you had to do a, a three mile trot wearing these things and that respirator and then at the end of it they expected to shoot your shooter when the mask was like halfway full up with you know sweat this is a uh, early strange really because he's got 72 pattern webbing here now the likes of Russ Mitchell and a few of the webbing boys will know what that is but strange because he's got a very early respirator pouch and that's probably some sort of uh, you know, the, um, decontamination kit for nuclear biological warfare. And uh, yeah, well, this is a reasonable um, representation of my era. Self-loading rifle, the god of all rifles. Um, Started off with DMS boots. See the putties, ours were black. We had to dye ours black because we were a rifle regiment. Lightweights, 58 ribbon pack, pattern webbing, and obviously it's a parachute regiment, Barry, but that was, I know I used to have power smocks as well. The only thing I didn't like about the power smock was the press studs on the bottom. They were using the pop off. Ladies and gentlemen, I've just got all excited looking at all this. Oh, I'll bring you back. I need a moment. Guns, guns, guns.